Okay, everyone, welcome to this uh, webinar on managing mold illness in children. I'm like super excited to be uh, sharing the room today with Dr. Scott McMahon uh, from New Mexico. How are you, Dr. McMahon? I'm doing great, Sandeep. How are you today? I am fantastic. Um, super excited on, on talking about this subject of mold illness in, in children because I think it's really a under-recognized subject and one that hasn't been covered in a lot of depth so far. So I really hope that we can introduce a bunch of different facts that will be helpful for people. And, uh, and you being a pediatrician, I think, you know, it's just a, a, you're the perfect person to have to discuss this subject and to illuminate what's different about treating mold illness in children and what things we need to be aware of. So thanks so much for, for coming along today. Oh, it's my pleasure. So before we start, I just want to suggest to people that to get the most out of this webinar, if possible, if you may care to please close or min minimize other browser tabs and have a pen and paper ready because there may be just a couple of little things uh, that are mentioned during this call that uh, may be new or uh, may be worth jotting down for you. So we'd really appreciate your full attention and I think this call will definitely have some new information that you will not find elsewhere. I'm going to talk about this later on, but we're really passionate about this course uh, called Mold Illness Made Simple that uh, I've developed to help people to understand CIRS or mold illness uh, really easily. And so if, if you can't hang around for the whole call, we are going to be offering a coupon, which is called Kids Beats uh, SIRS. Uh, and so if you need to go, that is going to give you 25% off the call, off the course rather. And, and that's available for the next 48 hours. Okay, a little bit about me. Most of you already know me, so I'm going to I'm going to jump through this really quickly. As you know, uh, I am the creator of the Mold Illness Made Simple course, and I'm also the first non-US doctor to become uh, certified in the Shoemaker Protocol for Chronic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. Uh, I created a document called Surviving Mold Down Under, which I've hoped has made it uh, a lot easier to understand this illness and how to navigate it for people in Australia. And I was lucky enough to co-author the physician's consensus statement on CIRS with Dr. Ackley, Bernstein, Rappaport, McMahon, and Shoemaker. Uh, so that's a little bit about me, and, and there's much more about me if you have a look at the moldillnessmadesimple.com website, uh, which, which uh, outlines our course. Would you like to introduce yourself, Dr. McMahon? Certainly. Uh, my name is Scott McMahon. I've... Uh, I graduated from Creighton University School of Medicine in 1989. I did a, a, a very prestigious residency at Duke University Medical Center, finished in 1992. Been in Roswell for the last 25 years seeing children. And for the last uh, seven, eight years, I've been involved uh, seeing children and adults with chronic inflammatory response syndrome. Great. And would you like to talk a little bit about the, the papers that you've co-written or, or written as the sole author? Sure. Um, most recently, uh, in 2017, I published two papers. One of them uh, looks at the way we make the diagnosis of chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And I'd like to think that I simplified it. I took the, the, what was already in the literature from the United States government publication and what Dr. Shoemaker had, had done and, and, uh, and basically distilled it down to a certain number of symptom clusters and a certain number of abnormal labs out of the standard ones that we do. And if uh, a, a child or an adult meets those criteria, the diagnostic error is extremely low. Like for instance, our error in children is around one in a million and our error in adults is about one in 5,000. And if you know anything about medicine, those are really pretty amazing numbers. So that was one thing. And, and from that, we developed you know, some prevalence data of how often that we were seeing chronic inflammatory response syndrome in my own pediatric practice. And you know, the important thing about that number is it's a, it's a very minimum. These are the ones that I've actually seen in the office and saw that they had symptoms, and then we worked them up and saw that they truly had chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So that was pretty amazing. 
The other study that I did was looking at visual contrast sensitivity in children. There are, uh, there are norms that we look at for, for adults, but there were no norms for children. So we looked at about 100, almost 160 children who had, uh, um, uh, who were just showed up for, for well checks in our office. And in our screening, uh, we tried to remove anyone who had multiple system illness and later worked them up to see if they had SIRS. And in those who didn't appear to have SIRS, we actually did their, their um, visual contrast sensitivity. And what we found was that the norms for children are the same as what we use as norms for, for adults. Not only that, we didn't see any difference between uh, boys and girls. We didn't see any difference between kids who had asthma or who didn't have asthma, or for that matter, any other chronic illnesses. We got prevalence data from that too, which is different than the prevalence data we got from the first one. And again, prevalence is just a, it's an idea of how many people in the population actually have this illness. So in the first study, we were looking at people that I, we had already diagnosed with, with um, SIRS. In this one, we were looking at healthy kids. And what we came up with was an amazing number of, of the 160 that we looked at, at least uh, 12 of them already had SIRS, and the other eight are in the, in the process of being worked up. So what it showed was that at a minimum, 7.6, or one out of every 14 children, has this illness. And at the maximum, from what we have, somewhere around 12.5%, 12.7%. That could mean one out of every eight children. That means in every classroom, there could be four children who have chronic inflammatory response syndrome. That means in every day that a pediatrician is seeing a full load of patients, he's seeing three or four kids that have SIRS and may not even know about it. Wow, so that's, that's, that's quite mind boggling, isn't it? And that if, I guess if the average physician knew about that, or if the average pediatrician knew about that, that would, that would really make a huge difference in their practice, wouldn't it? Well, it's, it, it would, Sandy. It's, it's actually, it's, it's staggering how yeah. high that number is. You know, we in pediatrics know that asthma is by far and away the most chronic, I'm sorry, the most common chronic illness in children. By far and away. It's not even close with anything else. Mm -hmm. This is more than asthma. This is higher than the prevalence of asthma is in pediatric children. I guess all children are pediatric. I mean, that's absolutely mind-blowing. And, and, and the saddest part about it is that most doctors aren't aware of this illness yet, and so they're missing it. Well, so you're saying this could quite possibly be the most common illness in children, and, and the huge problem is that, that most physicians aren't even aware of it. I mean, that's, that's, actually, that's actually beyond belief, isn't it? Well, it is. And, and you wonder, like, where are all those children? How come nobody's picked it up? Well, again, if you know about pediatrics, you know that one of the most common problems that we have is chronic abdominal pains. And, you know, we have a workup that we do and we send people to gastroenterologists and they do their workup. And, and for the most part, these kids come out with a diagnosis that's basically functional mm -hmm. because nobody knows what's really wrong with them. But when I take those functional children, and this is something that I'm hoping to, to publish later this year, when I take those functional children and I work them up for SIRS, 9 out of 10 have SIRS. And wow. this is one of the biggest problems in pediatrics, and nobody knows what causes it. I can say the, almost the identical thing about chronic headaches. You know, mm. and, and it doesn't matter what kind of headaches, whether you're looking at chronic daily headaches or um, cluster headaches, migraines, or tension headaches. Nine out of 10 people that I evaluate for SIRS that have chronic headaches end up having SIRS. And when we treat them, they get better. So when these data come out and people accept them and replicate the studies that I've done, when those data come out, it will change pediatrics markedly. And interestingly enough, we see the same kind of results in adults too. Wow. So yeah, what you've already said so far is already already staggering. And if people even just take this home as a as a take home point, that's already pretty big, isn't it? Just yes. just how prevalent it is, and also how advanced the science on SIRS already is. I think is all is is also quite staggering. So um, yeah, wow, this is this is really exciting stuff. 
uh, really you know be excited to see what else comes out of this webinar and, and out of this information um, on, on SERS and children. Okay, great. Are you seeing a diagram now, Scott, um, on what is mold illness or SERS? I'm seeing this picture of an incredibly handsome man. Oh, okay, uh, oh, so that's, that's still my picture up there, is it? No, no, I'm sorry, Sandeep, it's mine. Oh, okay, right, sorry. You know, I just got confused when, when you mentioned the word handsome. Um, yeah, you can see. <laughs> exactly. Let me just see. Okay, for some reason, this is not working in slideshow mode, so what I'm going to do is just uh, put this on as large as I can and okay. um, and just run it on non-slideshow mode. I think that's probably the best bet. Is that now showing up on the what is mold illness um, diagram? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Okay, so most of you who have looked at survivingmold.com and the uh, information that's out there on SIRS um, have noticed that it's quite complicated to understand what exactly SIRS is and how it develops. And um, I've developed a slightly simpler diagram to explain this. And uh, if you start on the left-hand side of this diagram, you'll see that biotoxins are small compounds that can be that can be brought into the system or into the body through a water damage building, or otherwise known as a moldy building, or a tick bite, most commonly. Um, there is also other causes such as infected bodies of water and spider bites and so on, but they're pretty rare. So if you mainly think about them through water damage building or tick bites, and realize that these are compounds that, that move from cell to cell and disrupt the functions of cells. So they don't live in the, in the blood. Uh, they're mainly in the cells, and that's one reason we don't actually have a blood test looking directly for mold toxins in the blood is because they're not actually there. So if you get exposed to one of these biotoxins, such as through a water damage building or a tick bite, and you're genetically susceptible, now this is another really key point, that not everyone is susceptible to developing SIRS uh, or mold illness. Only around 24 or 25% of the population have what we call a HLA susceptible gene type. So if you have uh, this genetic susceptibility, then instead of mounting a proper antibody response, what happens is we tend to develop a chaotic and ineffective if inflammatory response that creates dysfunction of many bodily organs. So another way of picturing that is that there's a silent fire going on in the body that's actually involving almost all of the tissues and organs of the body. So as a result of the silent fire, which we call SIRS, many people became become hypersensitive to mold and chemicals. So uh, if you have SIRS or a, if a child of yours has SIRS, they may go into a building that seems fine for other kids or for other people and they may say, I'm not feeling well, mummy. I'm not feeling right. My head's hurting. My tummy's hurting. And otherwise, um, those kind of symptoms may be thought to be emotional, but it, it's, it's important to know that in this case, it may be because there's a silent fire going on in their body of inflammation and that they're much more sensitive to mold and chemicals than other people would be. And so as a result of this whole fire of inflammation that's going on in the body, we get high levels of certain inflammatory compounds, which you can see over here on the top right of this diagram. Now, this is a little bit of an alf alphabet soup, but the main ones that you need to know are called C4A, TGF-beta, and MMP9. So these are inflammatory compounds that are fueling the fire of inflammation in the body. So they're like bits of wood which are fueling that fire to be even more strong in the body. And on the other hand, if we track back here to, to, the, um, to the, the last box, we also get low levels of hormones that regulate the inflammatory response. So not only are we getting compounds that are fueling this fire of inflammation in the body, we're also getting low levels of hormones that normally would dampen this fire. And they include MSH and VIP and ACTH. 
So this, there's a few acronyms that there's no way you're going to get around uh, learning if you want to learn about SIRS. But in this diagram, there's about six of them. If you take a note of all six of those and just try to break them up, so going back to those three in the top right, they're what we call inflammatory cytokines or inflammatory compounds, and that's C4A, TGF, beta-1, and MMP9, and then MSH, VIP, and ACTH are regulatory hormones. They're hormones that regulate the inflammatory response. So they go low in, in patients with mold illness or SIRS. So as a result of these hormones going low, particularly MSH going low, we tend to get a special bug in many patients with SIRS that gets into the deep nasal passages, and that's called uh, MARCONS, which is spelled M-A-R-C-O-N-S. And the problem is when you've got this, this bug, the Marcons, that tends to further lower MSH uh, hormone and therefore that blocks you from getting better from this illness. So it's important to know whether you've got Marcons so that you can eradicate that and then your, your regulatory hormones such as MSH have a chance of coming up. So I hope this, this gives a bit of understanding around the mechanism of SIRS or mold illness. Dr. McMahon, anything you'd like to add to that or do you feel that that explains it? Well, that was an excellent explanation of a very complicated illness, but if I might make just a couple points, yep. um, down at the bottom where you have EG, MSH, and you're talking about the chemicals that are involved in the inflammatory response, I would actually add in ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which, you know, not only does it involve, uh, is it involved in, um, you know, uh, regulating how often a person avoids or pees, urinates, but uh, also is involved in the immune response. And the other thing that I would say is um, where you were talking about chaotic, ineffective inflammatory response up at the top toward the yeah. center, mm -hmm. that as the person gets exposed over and over again, whether that's lime that's still inside them or they're living or working in a water damaged uh, building, as they continue to inhale mold toxins or bacterial endotoxins or inflammagens like uh, uh, beta-glucans and mannins and whatnot, those things are actually triggering their own immune response. And because they're, the immune response is not handling those properly, that immune response actually gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger as time goes on. And I think that's part of what we see with sicker quicker is just repeated exposures. And you'll see patients, uh, particularly in adults, but also in children, who when they get re-exposed, they can relapse and actually get worse. And that's because they, their immune system has already learned how to make a response and with a new exposure, an even bigger response. And so when it comes to treatment, it always comes back to toxin avoidance, you know, is the most important step. Great. Yeah. So that's a really important point that if you, if you don't get away from the toxins that are causing this, you can't really recover from this illness easily. I guess that's, right. that's a really important take home point. So thank you for that addition. And, and sometimes in children, they will recover anyway, but then they relapse in adults. It's really hard to get, uh, it's hard to get better if you don't get out of your toxic exposures. Great, thank you. And any any other points you wanted to mention? No, I this? think that was, that's an excellent, excellent review. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let me see now. Are we getting movement of the slides now? Not really. Okay. Uh, Maybe so they're moving in Australia, and we're just sixteen hours behind. Yeah, so, um, okay, that's probably a little bit long of a time delay, so I'm going to go back to this view. Now, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, for some reason I'm not technical enough to, to work this out. Um, <laughs> so I'll, just, I'll just work in this mode. So going into screening, so what do we mean by screening firstly? So if you've got a child who has been exposed to a biotoxin in some way, such as a water damaged building, you may be wondering whether they could have SIRS. Maybe they have some symptoms, uh, maybe they occasionally get some abdominal pain or some headaches, and you may be wanting to work out whether they should be further evaluated for this illness or SIRS. Now, one of the simple ways of doing so is through using what we call the symptom cluster table. 
And uh, this is something we use in adults as well. And generally speaking, in adults, we, we tend to use the cutoff of eight or more clusters um, tends to be highly indicative of SIRS. While if you have four or less, that tends to be very indicative that the person doesn't have SIRS. So, um, Dr. McMahon, I understand in kids, it's it's a little different in that generally young children particularly tend to have less symptoms and less bodily system involved involvement rather so we tend to use six or more clusters as being an indicator that they may have SIRS is that correct that's correct the um, and I use clusters uh, for diagnosis and for screening I also in children who are say under uh, six years of age, if I saw that they had chronic headaches or chronic stomach problems or uh, they were tired compared to other children their age, I would I would go ahead and work them up for SIRS just on that basis. If they had even any one of those. For children under under 11, I would look at those. I also look at you know frequent muscle aches that are often called uh, growing pains. I look at the inability to uh, to, to get potty trained by six years of age and inattention when they go to school. As far as clusters are concerned, in the research that I did, I found that uh, having a positive amount of clusters, so for kids who are 11 years or older, including adults, if you had eight or more clusters, that was highly sensitive for picking up uh, SIRS. And, and as you said, if they didn't have at least eight clusters, they probably didn't have SIRS. And for kids who are under 11 years of age, they almost always have six clusters or more. Okay, uh, so that's really, really important. And presumably sometimes one of the, the, the issues is in children is that they may not be able to describe their symptoms as accurately. So some of these symptoms are a little bit like unusual skin sensitivity. It may be that, you know, for a young child, for instance, they may not be able to put that in words. So um, I, I presume sometimes there's a little bit of guesswork involved in this, in this kind of cluster uh, evaluation when it comes to kids. Would you say that that's correct or there's some sort of educated guessing that would need to go on? That, that's correct. And and you know, you bring up a really excellent point there, Sandy. You know, it's really important, I think, for the practitioner to sit down with the patient or with the family, you know, if it's a young patient, and ask these questions and, and keep asking the question until you're pretty sure it's a yes or a no. Some people just give out checklists, you know, in medicine, and I don't think that's nearly as accurate. Um, because the parents don't always know what you're really asking. If you say, does your child have unusual skin sensitivity? Mm, you know, yeah. But sometimes if you ask that question and say, you know, do you have problems with constricting clothing or, you know, does light touch really offend your child? You know, you can get a, a yes where there might have been a, otherwise a no. So it's really important to do that. The other point I would mention, I don't know how familiar your, your, uh, your watchers are with the clusters, but if you have even one symptom from a cluster, then mm -hmm. it counts as a positive cluster. Yeah, that's an important point. Thank you for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. Great, and so for instance, just to, to put this in layman's language, so if you, if you were to ask your child, for instance, about difficulty concentrating, um, what's, what's kind of the, the language you might use in a, in a, you know, let's say a four or five year old in trying to ask them about, do they have difficulty concentrating? Would you mind giving us an example? Yeah, more? four or five is kind of tough. And, and if they're boys, it's even tougher because they <laughs> routinely have problems with attention. Um, but I'll ask, I'll ask the parents, you know, uh, does your child have difficulty focusing on a single task, you know, um, cons compared to other children his age? Do you see that he's just running around all the time and can't stay on task? Or, or do you see that he's able to do something that he enjoys and stick with it? Great. Yeah, that's a really good example. So it's important to know that the wording, you know, the wording needs to be clear, I guess, um, when, we're, when we're asking these things to parents or children um, so as to get an accurate response. And what we'll do is we'll try and um, try and send a simple version of this cluster chart out to viewers who have who've subscribed up to the Mold Illness Made Simple mailing list, just so they have a simple screening sheet that they can use to check with their kids if they're concerned that they may be suffering from SIRS.
Um, so just expanding on that, um, in children under 11 years old, they often may have single complaints. So this is a little bit of an exception to the, the rule um, that SIRS is what we call a multi-symptom, multi-system illness. And this is something I talk about quite a lot in the Mold Illness Made Simple course, is that in adults, it's, it's something that's going to be affecting a whole bunch of bodily symptoms, not just one. However, Dr. McMahon, when we were talking recently, you said that it often does start in children with just one bodily system. Um, so maybe could you talk a little bit more around how, how children under 11 years um, may present and how that's different to adults? Sure. You know, when the babies are born, you assume that they're not having any system problems because they certainly can't complain about it. And by the time they become teenagers, usually we see the classic multi-system, multi-symptom uh, illness that is chronic inflammatory response syndrome. So if you start at zero and somewhere along the way you have six, seven, eight systems involved, at some point you had to go through one where you only had one system. And I'd like to think in my pediatric work that that's what we've been able to develop is, is to actually see early on when children are having symptoms that they're having problems long before they get to multi-system illness. And, uh, you know, again, in children under five, I look for chronic headaches, chronic fatigue, and abdominal pains. And the truth be told, in my pediatric practice, I don't ask parents, do your children have chronic headaches, chronic fatigue, or chronic abdominal pains? Uh, but when they come and they complain about them, and I say, well, how long have you been having these belly pains? Well, you know, six months. I'm like, wow, that's a long time. And so I'll do the normal pediatric workup, what most pediatricians would do, to rule out things like ulcers and constipation and urinary tract infections and, and that like, rheumatologic illnesses. And almost always, that workup comes out normal. So then I do the SIRS workup. And that almost always, nine times out of 10, comes out abnormal. And then I sit down with them and, and meet with them in the SIRS clinic and, and we talk about that. We start treatment and nine times out of 10, we see their abdominal pains go away or get much, much better. So again, wow. in younger people, yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's really wonderful because I get to see these children that nobody really knows what's wrong with them and mm. make them better. It's awesome. So, you know, in, in children who are under six, we look for headaches, fatigue, or belly pains. And any one of them would make me start thinking about SIRS. If they had two or all three, it's almost every time it's SIRS. In children under 11, like I said, I would add a few other things in there. The inability to potty train by six years of age, which usually is an antidiuretic hormone deficiency. We see antidiuretic hormone deficiency in over 80% of our, of our kids. And then the other would be uh, inattention in school, where they're, they're being labeled as ADHD or the, 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 the school or the teacher is starting to question whether there could be some ADHD. Sometimes it is. And sometimes it's just plain SIRS. And so if you treat the SIRS, you see the inattention go away. And then the final one I mentioned before is, is myalgias, muscle pains that go on and on and on. It's okay to have growing pains where you're going through a growth spurt, but that should last only maybe a month or two. Shouldn't be going on two to three months, six months, something like that. So if I see prolonged growing pains, then we start the evaluation also. And by the way, those kids are going to go on to probably have fibromyalgia. But if you can treat it early, you can, leave, you can treat them and educate the family so that they can prevent sim system symptoms down the road. And they never have to have multi-symptom, multi-system illness because we caught it when they were a youngster. Yeah, and that, that's a really yeah, important, that's a really point, important point, point right there, um, right there Dr. Um, Dr. McMahon, in that right if we can prevent this, this, these kind of severe illnesses that, that I see a lot of, for instance, in my clinic, like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, which in many cases can just be manifestations of SIRS, then we can actually ensure our kids have healthier lives. And, Absolutely. And, lives. and that's, actually, um, that's actually a real motivation for 
for putting in the effort, I guess, to find out whether they could be suffering from this illness, isn't it? Absolutely. A at some point in time, I think when we have enough information, we probably should be screening children when they're very young, maybe even doing HLA. And I know that that makes some people uncomfortable about, about you know, screening for genetic illnesses. But on the other hand, you know, right now in my pediatric practice, we screen all newborns for 32 genetic illnesses, mm -hmm. every single one of them. And the reason we screen them is because if you find it early, you can affect therapy and you can prevent permanent symptoms. And I would argue that we have enough data at this point. We just haven't had any people replicate, you know, the data sufficiently and publish it to show that if you treat this early on, you prevent problems down the road. Mm -hmm. So that's another really important point there. Thank you. And the other thing we talked about um, was that, you know, in children who are suffering from autistic spectrum disorders as well, it, that's another area in which it's extremely important to screen them for SIRS. Would you agree, Dr. McMahon? Absolutely. There is, there is a tremendous amount of overlap between the symptoms that you see in SIRS and the symptoms that you'll see in full-blown autism, you know, on the far end of the autism spectrum. And many, many people believe that autism in the entire spectrum is a toxin-based illness. So it makes sense that at least some of these children, that their toxin was from a water-damaged building or possibly from Lyme. Uh, so, you know, in focusing some research funds um, on screening these children at a younger age before they're developing, you know, the, the symptoms that everybody can, can detect is autism, you know, by 12, 15 months of age. If we were looking for it at a younger age and demonstrated they had SIRS, we might be able to prevent a large number of autistic cases. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that's, that's it's right. becoming it's such, a, such a significant a, illness yeah, these days, isn't it? The prevalence of it is really increasing. Really and um, yeah, it's, it's a, a very disabling illness, obviously, and it very greatly affects the course of someone's life. So if we can find a way of helping people with this illness, um, the, you know, particularly if there's an environmental cause, such as water damage buildings that could be contributing, then uh, that, that's really important that we do do that as um, as physicians and as parents absolutely and you're right the the prevalence of autism is skyrocketing you know five years ago it was one in 88 kids the most recent thing I read was one in 66 but remember SIRS is at a minimum one in 14 and maybe one in one in eight and and possibly even higher than that right so yeah so that's another very important area Okay, so moving on. So I believe this is the, the new device you've patented, Dr. McMahon, is that right? For, for yes. VCS we have and children? A, we have a version that goes over the entire head. <laughs> no, we're just joking around here, folks. Now, this is just a, a stock um, photo, but generally with VCS testing or visual contrast testing in children, we still use either the online screening test, which is on the left-hand side of this slide, uh, which is at survivingmold.com, which usually costs about $20 if you just sign up and create an account. Um, or there is a handheld kit, which looks a little bit similar to the one on the right-hand side here, which some physicians have in their office, such as myself and Dr. McMahon, where you, you actually um, have a... Uh, uh, a certain device that that sits under the chin of children, and uh, and we we get them to point out whether the um, whether the lines are going up or going left or going right, and uh, and you found in your study that the that the VCS test was just as effective in children age seven or above as it is in adults. Is that correct? That's correct. What we you know VCS visual contrast sensitivity is an important test in the treatment and diagnosis of SIRS. And, uh, and so it's important to know what the normal ranges should be for children. And I think it was, uh, it was very valuable to demonstrate that, that the same level of abnormality shows up in kids as it does in adults. Okay, great. So we're still talking about a score above uh, five in the D row or the D column and a score above six in the C row or the C column, depending on which test you're using, is needed to pass this test. 
Uh, so that's that's, the, correct. that's the same criteria. Okay, great. That's correct. Yes. Okay, great. So now talking a little bit more on moving from screening to diagnosing. So let's say your child uh, has been exposed to a water damage building or a tick bite or some other uh, form of biotoxin exposure, and they have either a positive uh, cluster analysis or a VCS. So would you say one of the two would be sufficient um, to then want to, to pursue further um, diagnostic tests, Dr. McMahon, in a child, or would you want both of those tests to always be positive? You know, I, I think either one is sufficient to move forward. Yeah. So, so if your child had a positive cluster analysis or a positive visual contrast sensitivity test, you may want to get them to see a certified shoemaker physician, uh, and they would be able to run these kinds of tests. Um, and again, it's a little bit of an alphabet soup, um, but the, the tests are basically the same um, that we run in, in children as we run in adults. And, um, and sometimes I understand you might do a slightly smaller panel of, of, of biomarkers in, in children, Dr. McMahon? That's correct. You know, the children, uh, depending on their size, on their weight, they have less blood. So for instance, if I was gonna draw this entire panel that, that you have listed here, all of these biomarkers, um, I would probably, in a five-year-old, I would do it in two separate blood draws, you know, separated by maybe a week uh, of time so that I don't take too much blood out of them. I also, you know, Dr. Shoemaker has a, has a list of roughly 38 different tests that he does, which include these biomarkers, I don't do all of those in children for that exact same reason. And that, and also some of the tests that he's running in that, in that larger profile, looking to rule out diseases that don't routinely happen in children, like type two diabetes or uh, lupus or other rheumatologic uh, disorders. So I, I'm looking specifically to show that they do have this illness. Okay, great. So, so then in children, it can be sometimes a more concentrated blood panel. Um, in Australia, we don't have all of these tests easily available, but the ones on the left-hand side, with the except of, exception of MSH, are available here easily through uh, the local laboratories, um, such as HLA gene testing, which often gets called celiac um, gene studies, and then VIP, Marcon's testing, uh, which can done, be sent to Microbiology DX or sent via Nutripath, and then ACTH and cortisol and ADH and osmolality. So in Australia, the other tests, including C4A and TGF beta 1 and VEGF and MSH particularly, uh, are available through Quest, uh, and, and uh, we, we do have an arrangement through some of the certified docs in, in the Sunshine Coast of Queensland in Sydney, New South Wales and Melbourne, Victoria, to have people uh, have blood collected for Quest. And at this stage, that is the testing that is basically the gold standard that uh, corresponds with the studies on SIRS that have been done by Dr. Shoemaker. And at this stage, we can't recommend the local testing with NutriPath because it's not corresponding well enough to, to give us a strong confidence in, in that testing. Okay. Great. So jumping on to treatment now. So let's say let's say a child has tested up positive for some of these biomarkers, which shows that they do have this this silent fire of inflammation going on in their body. There's some good news here, uh, and the good news is that younger children often get better quicker or faster than adults do. And as we say, if if you pick it up early, um, the outcome is often very good. Could you expand on this, Dr. McMahon? Certainly. You know, when I see adults who have had symptoms for 15 or 20 years and they have multi-system illness and oftentimes their labs are just outrageous and they're really struggling with life in, in many areas of life. When I see children, you know, particularly five, six, eight years old, I'm oftentimes seeing them with, with one system is involved and instead of having to do cholestyramine, the powder, for two or three months, I can treat them sometimes in two weeks, and they'll right. be completely back to normal. They have a hundred percent resolution of their symptoms, whereas 
you know, what we see in adults is more likely they have about 70% resolution of their symptoms, somewhere between 70 and 90%. So not only do they get better faster, but they have a more complete recovery. And then because you know about the problem and by using the HLA, you can identify what toxins are going to offend them and make them relapse, then you can prevent after that. And so it's just so much better to find them at a young age. Absolutely. So that's really huge motivation for parents uh, who, who have children who, who could be suffering from CRS to, to just look at this problem as early as possible and not leave it for too long. Because that's really good news that if, if they can be treated and identified early, they could just have a very quick course to recovery and, uh, and hopefully to not developing further problems in future. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And so moving right ahead here, as Dr. McMahon mentioned, the most important step of the SERS treatment program uh, in kids or in adults is removal from exposure. So in the case of water damage buildings, it means getting into a building, uh, which means home and school building, that uh, is safe. From a, uh, from a water damage perspective. And really, in general, that's going to mean a, a house with an ERMI that's less than two or a Hertz Me 2 score that's less than 11. Is there one of the, the two that you prefer to use, Dr. McMahon, in, in, uh, in children or, or in, in patients in general? I use both. I think they, they actually give you different information. And, mm -hmm. of course, from an ERMI, you can calculate a Hertz Me too. Yeah. Um, but, but I use both. Okay, great. And so if you've got a child who's in a, uh, in a building that has, has a high ERMI score, um, is, is there a particular process um, or a particular series of steps which you suggest that parents uh, follow in order to, to work out what they're going to need to do to remediate or relocate and, and get, into a, uh, get into a safe building? Yeah. When when we see new patients, we always go through what their environments are like. You know, I'll ask them what school they're going to, and I have pretty good insight into what schools have problems, what portions of what schools, for instance, one of the high schools in my city uh, just has problems in the freshman wing, and most patients and teachers do quite well in the rest of the high school. But in that one wing, I have a lot of patients every year and a lot of the teachers. Uh, in one of our other high schools that has a basement, uh, I just get a lot of patients every year because no matter how much they remediate, there's only so much that they can do. Uh, but when I, when I find that patients have problems in their homes, what I usually recommend is that they, uh, that they hire a contracted, licensed um, mold inspection uh, agency to come in, take a look, find where the problems are. They'll create a, uh, a remediation plan. I actually work with one here in my, in my hometown uh, that uh, is called uh, Merck, Mold Inspection Remediation uh, Company, and, and, uh, or in construction, I'm sorry. And, and I work closely with them, and, and a lot of their patients, um, I, you know, I, I review their tests and I, and I review their, their reports with the patients. And, and so the idea is to find out where the problem is and then get a licensed contractor that has mold remediation expertise in to take care of it. That last step, I can't emphasize too much because if, if Joe Johnny on the spot comes in and does remediation in your home, they may do a tremendous job with the carpentry. But if they don't know about mold and how it harms people, how it might harm themselves, they could actually make the problem worse by spreading it throughout the house. You know, taking an area behind a cavity, for instance, and opening it up. So where you're getting a small amount of mold being pulled through by airflow in the home, now you have a huge amount of flow going through. And then of course you also have to look at the HVAC, the, the heating, and ventilation and air conditioning. If you don't look at that system, um, because it frequently is, is part of the problem, if not all of the problem, then you'll miss, you'll miss mold. Hmm. 
Okay, so the, the, there is a number of subtleties to this, it sounds like, Dr. McMahon, and, that, and that's something we, we cover in the Mold Illness Made Simple course as well. And, and one really important thing to know is not just any indoor uh, environmental professional is going to suffice. Uh, in terms of uh, giving you advice as to what needs to be done to your building. You really need to get an IEP, which is short for Indoor Environmental Professional, to, that, is, that is familiar with SIRS and familiar with the level, of, uh, the level of cleanliness that a home or a school needs to achieve in a patient with SIRS if you're going to get proper advice. And therefore, it's really important to ask them a, a, a bunch of different screening questions to make sure that they understand this illness and understand how to work with ERMI testing rather than just air testing so that you get the proper advice. And so this is a very important step and it's a step that can be quite easily mucked up as Dr. McMahon mentioned. So um, you know, one, one reason to take a look at this course is just to get some of those questions to make sure that you get a, a, a IEP who's really at a level that's going to help you through this uh, step of the pro protocol. So I think that's a very important point. That's a really important point that you make there, Sandeep, if you don't mind my just mentioning yeah. it again. Yeah. Different indoor uh, environmental professionals, IEPs, are going to test your house in different ways. And the people that don't really know what they're doing will usually just come in and they'll take one air sample from a machine that's a pump, it's about this big, and they'll take a five minute sample that will take 75 liters of air, and they'll do it inside your house one time or maybe once in several rooms, and then they'll do one outside and they'll compare those. And there are a credible number of subtleties in how you interpret that. And if you don't interpret it correctly, you're likely to tell somebody that the home is fine. And the problem is that that way of doing testing is the least likely to find mold. It's the least likely method, and that's what most people do because it's easy and because it's cheap. But it also gives people a false sense of protection because it's, it's not sensitive enough just doing one sample inside and one sample outside. It's not sensitive enough to say that the house is clean. You have to do other, other forms of testing, whether that's bulk or tape or ERMI or hurts me or what most IEPs recommend is a combination of both. So mm -hmm. if you don't have somebody who's really SIRS competent, then you're likely to get information that's garbage. And one last thing I'll say about that is on the Surviving Mole website, there is a, a consensus statement that was put together by yourself and myself and a number of other, <coughs> excuse me, another number of other SIRS uh, doctors and some IEPs that have, you know, on average about 30 years experience and who are SIRS aware. And there are actual guidelines there that you can read. It's about a 35 page document, but if you read that and you understand it, you will be well equipped to have your house uh, evaluated. Right, yeah, so thank you for that, that extra addition. And so folks, I really want you to take notice of this. This is the most important step of the SIRS treatment protocol, and it's very important to get this step right and, uh, and, and not to muck this step up. If you get it right, your children are going to get well, and that's, that's extremely important to, to take note of. So uh, moving right along here, the second step of the SIRS treatment protocol, which is also very important, um, and, and we're combining two steps here actually, is um, binders and also treating Marcons. Now, generally speaking, Marcons as, or nasal staph is something we look for in, in slightly older children. Would you say more children above the age of seven, Dr. McMahon, or? I, I'm more likely to test Marcons in teenagers. In teenagers, right. Okay, so, so if, if your child is younger than the teen years, it's less likely that they will have Marcons, and therefore in most cases it probably isn't necessary to pursue that step of the, of the treatment program. Is that right? Yes, I, I do test Marcons in children if they're not improving the way I expect them to. You know, I, I've seen enough children, I've seen enough adults now that, and, and I follow them closely enough that I really have a good sense of how quickly you should be getting better. And if you're not following that, then I will follow up with Marcons. 
Okay, great. And so tracking back to binders, so the, what binders are is they're a certain type of medication or sometimes they can be natural substances as well that actually bind onto biotoxins in the small intestine. And these biotoxins come into the small intestines through the bile. But the problem is if you don't use binders, the body tends to recirculate these biotoxins. So if you introduce binders into the system, we can latch onto these biotoxins and take them out of the system um, into the stool and those biotoxins no longer um, can be triggering the inflammatory cycle in your body or the, the silent fire of inflammation. So the most common binder and the most effective binder is cholestyramine. And you can see the spelling of that on this left-hand side diagram where you can see some tubs of medication there. Uh, it's called CSM for short. And the dosage in children is different for adults. Um, and the dosage is 60 milligrams per kilogram per dose three times a day. So TID is medical Latin um, for three times a day. And we use that same formulation up to 120 pound children or 55 kilogram children. After that weight, we start to use an adult dose of four grams four times a day. Is that correct, Dr. McMahon? That is correct. Okay, great. And you, and I believe you've mentioned that in the, in the vast majority of children, particularly small children, cholestyramine works beautifully. And uh, could you please tell us quickly about some ways in which you can actually get children to, to tolerate cholestyramine? Uh, well, cholestyramine is a powder. It tends to have an orange color. Different manufacturers are a little more orange or a little more yellow. And it's, it's gritty. It's like sand. I actually, I call it orange sand. Um, yeah, clever. The, um, I, it doesn't matter to me what method you use to get it into your child. You know, if they can take it in water, like two or three, three or four ounces of water, that's fine. Um, but it doesn't have to be. It can be in juice, orange juice, orange juice with pulp. It can be in mixed it with food. Um, and I know in general we don't do cholestyramine with food, but with children you do what you have to do. Um, you can put it in applesauce. My favorite way, and I'm not very good at taking uh, medicines, and, and I took some cholestyramine for about a month just to see what would happen to me. Uh, and and so, you know, I tried to take a dose straight. Uh, it didn't go. It didn't go well. So I I took a banana, and an apple, and uh, some grapes, and I put them in the blender with just a little bit of liquid. It could be juice or water. And I the blender up, and I poured two or three ounces of of the cholestyramine in a a glass. I poured my dose, which was a full scoop three teaspoons worth in into that and mixed it up. I put just a little bit of grape juice, like one or two teaspoons to make it drinkable. And I was able to just drink it right down. Another important point about cholestyramine is that once you take the dose, I want you to get everything out of your mouth. I don't want it staying, sticking to the teeth because it can affect the enamel over time. So it's important after you take your dose to follow it with juice, or water or something to get it off the teeth or even brush the teeth if you have to rinse and spit whatever is necessary but get the extra out of the mouth great so they're really important points about cholestyramine uh, and so so an important thing is that you can mix it with some food to get your kids to to, to take this medication that's perfectly fine and um, and 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 it, and and really that probably should be done that way because you don't want your children to develop an aversion to cholesterol I mean you want them to be to want to take it and uh, and therefore mixing it in with apple sauce or, or dr. McMahon's other super recipe he mentioned there is a really good idea I'll very quickly mention well call well Alcohol is the, the main alternative to cholestyramine, and it's mainly used in children 10 to 17 years of age. And we usually use one to three, that should be one to three tablets. Twice I think it's a day. tablets. Yes. Yeah, it's tablets. And uh, twice a day, depending on their weight, and, uh, and your physician can tell you exactly. So the adult dose is two tablets three times a day. So I would say in many cases it could be one tablet 
twice a day, just depending on the weight. And uh, if your child can't swallow tablets, it can be crushed. And and can that, that one can also be added to food. Is that correct, Dr. McMahon, if needed? That's correct. Okay, great. So one way or another, you should be able to get binders into your child, and that's an extremely important uh, step for them to get well from SIRS. So these are the two most important steps, actually, is just being removed from exposure and taking binders. Now, if they're an older child and they have tested positive for Marcon's, there is something called Beg nasal spray, which is usually um, sourced from a, a, a compounding pharmacy such as Hop Hopkinton Drug in the United States or in Australia, Your Solution Compounding Pharmacy or another compounding pharmacy. And often the dosage is one spray each nostril two or three times a day rather than two sprays three times a day, excuse me, that we uh, use in adults. But moving right along here. Uh, just one moment. Can, okay. can I make one other point about that, yeah, Cindy? Yeah. If you can do those first two steps of therapy, which is get out of your, you know, toxic environment or remediate it properly and take either cholestyramine or well call for the diagnosed period of time, in children under 19 years of age, we have 70% improvement in at least in, in well over 90% of our kids just from those two steps. All right. So that's 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 pretty astounding. So in the majority of cases, that actually makes it a lot less overwhelming for people, I think, as well, just to know that a lot of the time, if you just do these two steps, your kids are going to get well. And yes. um, the other steps are just in, in cases where they're not getting as well as we would expect. Correct. Uh, so, so that that's really that's really good actually. Just to take that as a take-home point, there's really only two main steps for children, and that's removal from exposure and taking binders. So, this is there's a lot of hope for your kids here, folks. So, um, moving on to this, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but in some cases, VIP nasal spray, which I call the cherry on the top of the SIRS treatment protocol, can be, can be used in children, particularly ch children of an older age. And would you like to very quickly speak to that, Dr. McMahon, about what experiences you've had in, in, with using VIP nasal spray in older children? Right. Well, we've used VIP now in seven children and, you know, under an experimental protocol. And the results in six of those seven have been nothing short of phenomenal. In, in one child, uh, the patient was maybe 14 years of age, had not been to school for over three years, almost four years, because she had been so sick for so long. And, and I came in to start therapy at about that time. And we started her on VIP at one to 10 dilution. And within a couple months, she was back to school for the first time in almost four years. And she's now been on VIP for two years, and she rarely misses school. In another child, she had missed 27 days of school the year before, missed almost none the following year on VIP. And another child, the school was sure that he had uh, ADHD and he was being treated for ADHD with, with uh, Ritalin or Ritalin type medicines. Mm -hmm. um, he was having a lot of behavioral problems. We treated him uh, first with the first few steps of SIRS and he got much better, but he was still having behavior problems. We started VIP and we saw his behavior problems went away within a couple weeks. Later on, we, uh, for financial reasons, the VIP was stopped and the behavior problems started to come back. We treated him again and guess what? Behaviors problems started getting better almost immediately. Got another child who was much smaller. Uh, I think he was about three years old, hyper all the time really not very uh, responsive with his parents, just bouncing off the walls all the time, gave him VIP, and his behavior changed immediately. He also was having these mood swings that would last for, for hours, just crying tantrum fits. And when he started on VIP again at 1 to 10 dilution, within, I think it was a week or two, those were completely gone unless he didn't get a dose of his medicine. If he was late on his medicine, he would start having the tantrums again. So really impressive results with VIP in, in children so far. Not enough to really say, you know, this should be a part of it. Need to do 
you need to do some publications, you need to do some case studies, but really promising results early on. Okay, great. So in those children that don't get better from those two simple steps, it's really, really exciting to know that we've got this other step of VIP nasal spray that could be extremely helpful in, in these children. And, and in some other cases, according to the physician's discretion, they may use some of these intermediate steps such as uh, mineral nasal spray and so on in certain cases, I understand. Exactly. Uh, so that, so that's so really the, the take home point here folks is that the, the first two steps are going to get the majority um, of children better but there are a number of other steps that can be used at a physician's discretion so it's very important to get a certified shoemaker physician if at all possible to to help your children so some of the observations in closing uh, in, in treating SIRS in children are that the principles of diagnosis and treatment are basically the same with some slight variations um, but there's less symptoms and, um, and generally we test less biomarkers in young children. The dosage of some medications is slightly different and some are not used. So these are really some of the take home points from this webinar today. I hope this has been really helpful for people. Anything uh, you would like to add um, about these final observations on, on, on treating SIRS in children, Dr. McMahon? I think you summed that up quite well, Sandeep. Um, do we have any questions that we need to answer? Yeah, we do. And I, I, think, um, I think we should, we should jump into those now. Um, or yeah, I think we'll, we'll answer one or two and then I may quickly uh, talk a little bit about the course and then I could jump into a few more. Do you have any time restrictions, Dr. McMahon, or you're, you're okay too? Yeah, I have to finish before Monday at nine. <laughs> Okay. All right then. Um, I'm yours until then. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So we. So that means we have another 24 hours or so. Is that correct? <laughs> That's correct. Excellent. So the first question, Dr. McMahon, is what recommendations do you have for HLA positive parents um, or SIRS patient parents? regarding being proactive in testing and monitoring their children for possible SIRS activity through lab work. Does that question make sense? That is. So yeah. there are a couple ways that I approach that, uh, and they, they differ based on, on what the, the, uh, the parent's HLA is. So, for instance, if, if the parent has two um, mold HLAs, you know, like 7253 and a 4353, they have a, a mold and say a dreaded. Well, I know that every child that that parent sires is going to have one of the HLA abnormalities. Right? They're going to get they're going to get one from that parent and maybe one from the other parent too. And that's important because most of our younger children that we see are doubles. They have it from both sides of the family. You only have to have it from one side of the family to get this illness, but most of our younger children are doubles. Um, so, so if a parent had a double of, of their own, you know that the child is affected. So it's important at some point to do the HLA, but you don't have to do it when they're really young because you know it's already abnorm abnormal. One of the screens that I do in my pediatric office when I see somebody who I'm thinking might have SIRS, but I'm not convinced, and, and the parents are not convinced, is I'll do the HLA, and I'll do an ADH osmolality and an ACTH cortisol, which are all tests that you can do in Australia, if I, if I understood you correctly. And what that yes. tells me is if, if, if two or three of those are abnormal, it's going to be SIRS, and then I know to do the whole workup. And you know, if I were a pediatrician in Australia, what I do is I would refer that person to uh, to Sandeep or to one of the other SIRS certified physicians in Australia. Yeah, that's um, what Janet Kim is the other one. Yeah. Exactly, um, nice lady. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so that's that's what I would do. I would do the ADH osmolality and the ACTH cortisol. I have started doing VIP and MSH also. I think MSH, you said you have problems uh, obtaining, but doing mm -hmm. VIP also because, you know, if you have four abnormals, and oftentimes you will have all four will be abnormal, you've already made the diagnosis based on your system symptom clusters, system symptom clusters, yeah. and the number of labs are abnormal. You have enough data to make the diagnosis right there. Okay, great. So that's what I do. 
Okay, great. So that gives, gives us a bit of guidance on how you can follow your children if you're concerned about the possibility of them, them uh, developing SIRS. And, and this next question is, is linked. If a child with a multi-susceptible HLA, so uh, hopefully all of you know that there are different types of HLA genes, and, and Dr. Schumacher has referred to some of them as being multi-susceptible, and that includes the 4353 uh, haplotype, which is one of the ones that's been studied the, 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 the most um, in depth. So if a child with a multi-susceptible HLA is experiencing sy symptoms of SIRS, how do you differentiate between Lyme disease and mold? Uh, and at what tests are used and at what point in the protocol um, that are Lyme related. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, you know, I live in an area that's not very Lyme prevalent. There, there are 30 reported cases in the last 10 years, and, and I think I reported the last three of them. But I see people from all over the United States and even other countries. I've even seen a patient from Australia. And, and so Lyme is always in the back of our mind. And I will, I will usually do Lyme testing on patients that have lived in Lyme endemic areas when I'm doing the evaluation for, for SIRS. You know, even if they don't have um, one of the dreadeds or one of the, Lyme, um, one of the Lyme haplotypes, I will still make sure that they don't have that. Okay, great. And is there any particular type of testing that you consider to be most useful in excluding Lyme disease? The most useful one that I've seen so far comes from a, a company in the United States called DNA Connections, mm -hmm. where they're actually doing DNA and, yeah. and PCR DNA. And I, I haven't found anything close to as reliable as that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, yeah. So well, that's I've my favorite. that as well. And, um, and we have a, a lab called Australian Biologics over here who do, who do some DNA testing in urine. Um, for for Borrelia as well, so I think I think the PCR is 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 much more reliable. Do, I know Dr. Shoemaker has some objections with the usage of antibody tests such as Western blot testing, and pro, and I think the PCR probably does um, does take away those those problems. There is also something called. Um, uh, so there's the dot blot, which is one of the new testing, and, um, and, and there's some other unique testing, which is for the outer surface protein A. I forget what that test is called. Do you recall, um, Scott? I, I don't. Okay, no problem. I know what you're talking about, but I don't remember the name. Yeah, I've, I've forgotten it as well, because it's, it's actually a uh, nanospot, that's right. Um, nanospot. That's yeah, it. That's right. So that that that's actually another another test that that's being researched, and um, and some other docs like Dr. Andy Heyman are, are quite excited about that. So moving well, right says, along. Um, nano. I'm sorry. I said it says nano, and that's technological, so it must be the best. Yeah, exactly. If it's got the word nano in it, it it's got to be good. Yeah. Is there is there any correlation between SIRS in children and the development of adolescent mental health challenges, Dr. McMahon? Absolutely. And I think in your previous podcast, which I saw it with Dr. Mary Ackerley, which, by the way, was brilliant on both of your parts. Um, absolutely. We see that. You know, the brain is on fire. I once asked Dr. Ackerley to what mental illnesses can be caused by inflammation, and she said all of them. Right. So if you take a small child and you create an MSH deficiency – where their blood-brain barrier can no longer uh, keep the tight junctions that you're supposed to have. Now you start getting loose junctions, you start getting toxins and inflammations into the brain, they will create inflammation in the brain. That's what we see on Neuroquan. They will create inflammation in the brain, and, and that can, in some, lead to mental illness. It, we definitely see, you know, uh, uh, cognitive difficulties in well over half of our children, you know, and I could go symptom by symptom, you know, between 60 and 50 percent uh, uh, will have all the problems except for disorientation, which is closer to 40 percent. Um, it would be unrealistic to believe that they're not getting some degree of mental illness. We also see mood swings in about 75 percent of children, and mood swing is just a mild form of mental illness, you know, where you go from being perfectly happy and everything's great to, you know, in seconds over something that's trivial. It's, so my thoughts on that subject. 
Okay, great. So almost any mental health disorder really can be caused by SIRS is, is one of the take home points here. So that's great. Just a couple of quick corrections. It was actually NanoTrap was the name of that testing uh, on Lyme disease. And I just want to also clarify, Dr. Janet Kim doesn't see children. So just, uh, oh. just so you guys know. Um, well, then everybody should see Dr. Gupta. <laughs> That's right. If you're in Australia, that is. I think if, you, if you're in New Mexico, there's a really handsome doctor there, apparently. A very handsome doctor. <laughs> so moving right along, if one gets an ERMI and it reveals an unacceptable score of 4.9, but when calculating the Hertz Me 2 from it, it results in a score of zero, which score is considered more accurate? It's a, you, you can't answer that question directly, but I would probably go with the ERMI. But I would actually, as I'm not an indoor environmental professional, but I interpret these tests every day, I would want to actually look at the test before I told you the answer. Here's the reason. It's possible that you could have an ERMI that had a very high level of one of the 26 moles, which is not one of the five that we look at with hurts me. And it could be that that's not a toxin former, and so it's less less concerning. On the other hand, a 4.9 means that, they're, that you're about a thousand times higher than what you want to be in the amount of mold in your house. So what, what the zero hurts me says is, well, you don't have stachybotrys, and you yep. don't have ketomium, and you don't have walemia, but you may have all these other things that are showing up in the ERMI. And that's why I said earlier, they give you different information, and you really have to, have to look at uh, the, the individual situation to, to know what to say. And that's why you need an experienced person to be able to interpret those for you. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent answer. And I, I think the key to understand is that the Hertz Me Too just focuses on five species. And they are the five species which have statistically been associated more with SIRS. However, as, as Dr. McMahon says, everyone's individual. So if you've got an ERMI of 4.9, but a, a very low hurts me, it's going to be some other mold species other than the big five. And right. you've got to find out what does it mean that you've got that other thing, that other particular uh, mold species. And, and it could indicate that there is some significant water damage still happening, but you're going to need a further assessment. Uh, exactly. Two more, yeah, so, and, and if I can just say one more thing about that. I keep interrupting you. Sorry, Cindy. No, no, that's fine. Yep. We, we use the word mold all the time, but mold is really a euphemism. You know, in, in, in that paper that, that you and I worked on together regarding IEP evaluation of a house, there are 30 different toxins, inflammagens, and microbes that are identified that can trigger your innate immune system. And mold only is a part of about four or five of those. So right. you've got volatile organic compounds and microbial volatile organic compounds and spirocyclic drymanes and, and mannins and beta-glucans. I mean, the list goes on and on up to 30 of different things in a water-damaged building that can trigger you. So to just look at, at uh, a hurts me and say, well, it's okay for sure is not for everybody. Great. Thank you for that. And I know that there's things out to show that, that re-entrance into a home that has a good hurts me, 98% likelihood that you're going to be okay. But I take care of the 2%. And there are other things in that home that are not detected. The last thing I'll say on that is that the problem is the water damaged building. And Ermi and hurts me at, at the core, they're looking to really tell you, is this building water damaged or not? And so if you have one species that's very high, unless you can relate that there was, you know, an isolated incidence of why that is high in that particular room, you have to believe that the whole building is water damaged as a result of that elevated ERMI with a 4.9. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you I for that. Same, that same thing over and over again. Yeah, I, it's a very common common problem that I've seen in our patients here too. So thank you. Thank you for, for clarifying that. I'm going to change gears here very quickly and just do a uh, quick infomercial for our Mold Illness Made Simple course, if that's okay with you, Dr. McMahon. Um, I think your course is excellent. Thank you for saying that. And is that, showing, is that slide showing up for you? It is. Okay, great. So 
really the bottom line here, and, and this is actually really coming from my heart, is that SIRS can be extremely confusing and not only confusing, I, I want to clarify, it can be extremely overwhelming. Um, I've been through this myself personally and have been through the recovery process and I experienced overwhelm, I experienced confusion, I experienced anxiety about it. I had uh, concern about how, the, how it was going to affect the rest of my life. And I found that the information that was available out there was not that easy to comprehend when I had a foggy brain. So I created an eight-week online course to make this simpler for other people so they didn't have to go through the process that I did. And I don't know if you know Dr. McMahon, but I had to Skype with Dr. Shoemaker at 1 a.m. in the morning every time um, for around about nine months or so and, yeah. um, and read documents that had 100 or 150 pages, like consensus documents from the GAO and the WHO. I bet you had to do that too. Yes, sir. And, <laughs> I'm really making a slightly easier path for people here <laughs> than having to do that instead of reading around about 1,000 to 2,000 pages of documents that are extremely hard to understand. I've created an eight-week online course which is easy to understand and pretty much um, uh, everyone who's done it so far have fed back that they feel more clear, number one, less overwhelmed and they feel more hope. And why is that important? Well, that's hugely important because if you're going to keep moving on this journey to getting well, you need to have hope. You need to have clarity and you need to not be in overwhelm because what happens is when we're in overwhelm, we freeze and we don't do anything. And so when you're not in overwhelm, when you're in clarity, you move forward. And what one of my big passions is is for people to keep moving forward who have this illness and to get well to get to the other side of this illness and to actually move forward in their life in their lives to an even greater expression of their own life and, and nothing makes me more happier than to see that and I, I'm sure you've seen that a lot of times Dr. McMahon and it's and it's one of the best moments you can have. Absolutely you know, you're, you mentioned hope, and so many patients have seen 20, 30, 40 doctors before they finally get the right diagnosis, and most of them don't have hope, and, you know, our data shows that this is very treatable, and your course, you know, really makes a very complicated illness simple, and I'm very thankful that you have created this. Thank you, Sandy. You're very welcome. And, and look, I, I do believe that it, it makes things understandable. It goes through uh, concepts one by one and it breaks them down. And that's what we need if we're not feeling as sharp in our brain as we would like to be. And, and as Dr. McMahon's talked about, and particularly Mary Ackerley talked about last month, this is a condition that really affects your brain and it also affects your ability to learn. And therefore, you're probably not going to be able to understand hugely complicated information. You're going to need simple information. So if you look at the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see how I explain the concept of cytokines. So cytokines, which include things like C4A and TGF-beta-1, are chemical messengers or proteins which are used by the immune system to communicate with each other. However, they also trigger inflammation for healing the body. Um, however, when there's an imbalance of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, which really means compounds that fuel the fire of inflammation in the body and compounds which quench the fire of inflammation in the body, then we have a problem. We have a silent fire of inflammation going on in the body, which can lead to damage. So this is an example of how how I explain concepts which, which are otherwise very difficult, I think, um, in a much simpler way. So at at the end of that explanation, you should have a bit of a visual of what a cytokine is. And then what we do is we go one by one in explaining what each one are. So at the end of this course, you will understand what C4A is and what it does. You will understand what TGF-beta-1 is and what it does. And you will understand what MSH is. And these are really, really key things to understand. Otherwise, you can't understand what your blood tests mean. 
you've got to really have some some grasp of this to to have an idea of what's really going on in your body and how you can recover it. And so, secondly, if you look at the bottom left hand uh, side of this diagram, we talk about some of the different ways that a building can be fogged or gassed or sprayed. And we explain that none of these should be used as the sole remediation method. They are adjuncts to mold removal only. I break down the three major types of fogging, gassing or spraying methods and we explain why the, uh, the last one is the only one that we recommend and that's the only method that's endorsed by the surviving mold panel. So one thing you will get out of this course is information that is reliable and approved information by Dr. Shoemaker and his group of physicians and that's, uh, that's a big advantage over just getting the information through the Facebook groups and other groups although there is some excellent people on there like Caleb and other people who, who give very high quality information. Uh, at other times, there's just other people who, who are new to the whole thing giving information and they may not be giving the, the level of quality of information that you need to get better. So on the left-hand side, you'll see they're the sort of PowerPoint presentations and videos we provide in the course. On the right-hand side, you'll see the workbook that we uh, provide for each chapter. So there's 18 chapters to this course that, that are delivered over eight weeks and each of them have these video lectures and slides and then at the end of each, uh, each week we have a weekly quiz that you need to get through to get to the next one. But they're, they're basic and they just get you to revise the, the, the key concepts of each chapter. And then we also have the webinar archive. So all of the previous webinars which have been given so far, including Dr. Ackley, including Dr. Samantha Clark and Dr. Sonia Rappaport, all of those webinars are available uh, to people who subscribe. So again, um, we are offering this coupon for the next 48 hours. So if you go to the uh, Mold Illness Made Simple course and type in this coupon, Kids Beat Sirs, when you're signing up, you will get a 25 percent discount. I really believe this course is worth it and I, I can say that from full sincerity that it's very important to understand this illness properly and to have clarity uh, and, uh, and, and I'm very, very confident that you will get that from, from this course. Uh, so anything that you want to add before we jump back into questions and answers, uh, Dr. McMahon? Uh, no, I, I highly recommend your course. It's excellent. Thank you very much for saying that. Okay, so if infomercial done, and back into questions here. Um, so the next question we have, um, Scott, is can long-term untreated SIRS in mold-affected children become a neurologic and or developmental trauma in addition to SIRS? Absolutely, I mean, they're all connected together. Yeah, and, and I would add to that as well that the, the trauma of this illness is actually very under-recognized, I think, and, and the trauma of having to move house uh, or to have to leave your house for a certain period of time while it's being remediated um, is big. Many people um, have their family split or have family problems as a result of this illness. Um, the trauma from that to children and also to the adults themselves can't be underestimated. Uh, and some, in some cases, children have to change schools as well, I think, due to this illness. Yeah. And, and so all of those will be traumas. Sure. And in addition to that, some people um, don't believe. So you know, if I tell you I have a mold illness and you're my friend and you just don't believe me, well, that friendship will probably part as time goes on and, and there are people that find themselves quite isolated. Uh, families break up over this because maybe mom has the illness and dad doesn't. So, yep. and he doesn't believe that it's real. He doesn't want to spend the money to remediate the house or whatever. And yeah, it can be very traumatic. That's right. And maybe if, if, if you have a child who's slightly on the autistic spectrum or maybe already has difficulty making friends, then all of a sudden having to change school or having to, um, you know, have this illness on top of what they already had um, can also, you know, it can be a little bit of a setback. But the important thing is if, if they go through the treatment, they are going to get through it and get better and their social skills and so on are going to start to come back and um, they will um, form a better social circle with time and, uh, and they are going to have a, a normal 
productive life as they grow through childhood. So that that's some hope right there. Anything you would like to add to that? Um, I agree, absolutely. Okay, great. So, uh, Dr. McMahon, your research suggests that NeuroQuant is very accurate for detecting mold-induced multinuclear atrophy and inflammation. Is it equally accurate for detecting Lyme? That's maybe a slightly confusing question, but do you you sort of follow what they're what they're asking there? You know, I, I if if I get a NeuroQuant that suggests Lyme, I certainly will do more invasive testing in a patient if they haven't previously had that diagnosis. Um, you know, the, we don't really, I, I don't think we use it as a diagnostic criteria for Lyme disease, but it certainly would set me on that pathway if I saw one that was positive. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, and can, on the subject of NeuroQuant, again, can NeuroQuant be used to monitor treatment success or is there a significant lag time before inflammation and atrophy reverse themselves? And, and maybe you could just speak about NeuroQuant in children in general, if that's okay. Yeah. So before, you know, we, I had mentioned that as MSH becomes low and also TGF beta 1 and MMP9, some of those cytokines that you recently mentioned, as they become high, they degrade what's called the blood brain barrier. The arteries of your body, for the most part, throughout your body, they leak a little bit, but not the artery, and they leak into your tissues. But the brain doesn't like that. So where the arteries come to the brain, the brain offers a couple more little cells and they make instead of kind of loosey-goosey junctions where stuff can, you know, I'm sure my illustration is terrible here with my hands, but, but it, you know, in the rest of the body where, where small proteins are able to leak into the body, they're not able to leak into the brain. And the, the brain likes that. Very sensitive tissue. But as MSH drops, as MMP9 increases, as TGF beta 1 increases, as VEGF drops, you start taking tight junctions like this and they become looser junctions and stuff can start squirting into the brain out of the blood vessels. And those are things like toxins and products of inflammation, cytokines into the brain and setting up inflammation in the brain. So that's, that is a lot of what the SERS illness is. It affects your cognitive ability, it affects your caudate nucleus, which is involved in attention, uh, in your mood, your ability to recognize languages, uh, your motor planning, and, and other things. So it, it's involved in all those things. Half of your brain, typically, on a neuroquant will be uh, inflamed, swollen up. Half of your brain. The forebrain parenchyma, the white matter here, and the cortical gray that covers over it make up half of your brain, and they will be inflamed typically on a neuroquant. We see that in adults. We see that in kids. And what we've also seen in adults, and we haven't done enough in kids to be able to say the same thing, but what we see in adults is that as you follow the, the steps of Dr. Shoemaker's protocol, that the areas of your brain that are swelling up come back to normal, come back to control levels. And what the most recent study shows is that as you use VIP, that, that um, gray matter nuclei, like the caudate nucleus, start to build up again, where before they were small or atrophic, they start to get bigger and stronger. Um, we, it, it's almost like they're being rebuilt. And, and so pruning that was happening before, perhaps with elevated levels of C4A and whatnot, pruning is being reversed. And the opposite of pruning is like learning. And so the brain is improving and coming back to normal. And that's exciting. Great. Did I, and, did I break uh, that down well enough? Yeah, absolutely. That was great. I used and, really uh, non-technical. I used pardon? some fairly non-technical words there in a hope people will understand it. Yeah, I, I think it was understandable. Thank you. And yeah. so the obvious question that comes up um, for me um, is that if you're saying in children, the majority of people or majority of children rather will, will only need uh, the first two steps. So to remo be removed from exposure and um, to use binders, does that mean that in, maybe in their cases, chordate atrophy may reverse without use of VIP or that would VIP still be needed even if they're feeling better if we wanted to achieve chordate atrophy because obviously people parents are not wanting their children to have a an abnormal brain as they're growing up 
Yeah, time will tell. We haven't done enough neuroquants yet to know that. Um, time will tell. It's a yeah. good question. You know, we still look at the the whole protocol that we do with yeah. sugar. We just don't always do every step in children because we compare the risks versus the benefits of treating a particular step. And VIP is um, the most experimental. Okay. Great. And so on that point of VIP, for around how long do you generally need to keep children on VIP, or is that another an unanswered question at this point? At this point, it's an unanswered question. We, we generally speaking, haven't taken any children off of VIP because they're doing so well. The ones who have stopped it because of resources or travel or whatever, we have seen almost immediate declines when they came off. You have to keep in mind that VIP is a chemical that your body makes. Your brain makes VIP in the hypothalamus, and it does a number of things. It, it helps run your 24-hour clock, your circadian rhythm. It helps the neurons fire properly so that your brain functions properly. It, it, uh, it's a, it helps the secondary messenger C, cyclic AMP, in almost every cell of your body. Well, actually, every cell of your body uses that. And it's a major inhibitor of the immune system. And that's the problem in SIRS is that your immune system has gone wild. And, you know, the, the silent fire that you've talked about is, is raging inside. And VIP is a major inhibitor of that. And almost everybody is low in the amount that they're making in their body. So VIP, VIP supplementation for many people will be for life. Great. Okay. Well, that, that's actually quite surprising, and I, I didn't actually realize that. So thank you for, for clarifying that. Generally, over here, I've been using it in adults for, for 6 to 12 months generally and, uh, and using NeuroQuant um, studies as a way to, to determine how long I would use it um, in, in patients. So um, one of the topical um, question which has been coming up on the forums is about MSH and, and being able to raise lowered MSH. And, um, you know, in general, are you finding that that VIP nasal spray is raising people's MSH? And are there any other ways that you know of to increase MSH other than VIP nasal spray? And as an adjunct to the last question, I do the same thing, Sandy. I do, okay. And I you know, once they've been on it for a while, I try and wean them down to the lowest dose possible, okay. which sometimes is completely off, and sometimes it isn't. And oftentimes people just say, I feel so good on VIP, I don't want to wean. Okay, right. I haven't yeah, had that I one mean, it's, oh, I, Perhaps you will, because it's, it's like the closest thing to having their old life back. Okay, right. Yeah, I've had that before. So, yeah. As far as raising MSH, in the United States – we don't have a lot of choices. MSH used to be available here, and, and the FDA banned it a number of years ago. There are a number of research protocols going on, but we can't legally prescribe it here. That being said, there are people who uh, obtain it from uh, from labs. There are people who go who order it from Canada and in Australia, and probably throughout the United Kingdom. There are alternatives like Melanotan two that can be purchased and. Uh, um, some people, there's varying, varying effect. I've had a few of my patients who have, who have done that. They've obtained melanotan too for themselves, got a really good tan, um, but it didn't really increase their MSH. Didn't, right. didn't make a big difference for them. Um, right. you well, may I'm already doing issue. pretty well on my tan here. Um, so well, right you now, are. Sorry. I probably, probably don't need to, um, to take any MSH. Are you sure you're not double dosing? <laughs> But Last time you saw me, I was Caucasian, right? Exactly. We do see VIP come up in some people, and we don't see it come up in others. And we don't really know the reason for that at this point. It may be that the part of the hypothalamus that makes it has gotten burned out. It may be that the portal system, it may be that you're making it, but you can't get it out of. Um, I, I think that was Dr. Shoemaker's thought, is that you can't get it out of there to, to, to go to, to the uh, – um, well, you actually make it not in the hypothalamus, but in the pituitary. You can't get it to travel to where it needs to go. Don't know really why some people get better and some people don't. Okay, great. Okay, uh, that's a good answer. Thank you. Um, now, changing gears here a little, we know in pediatrics, <clears throat> some of the common problems that we encounter are children with growth issues and developmental delay. Um, can you talk about 
whether SIRS can be a contributing factor to growth issues and to developmental delay? Uh, so I'll take those one at a time. The first one, growth factor, I have seen it. It's usually only in more severe cases. Um, but it's fascinating because the pituitary makes nine different hormones. We only test six of them, and we see abnormalities in the systems involved in all six of those. Growth hormone is one of those nine that we don't test. It's the, one of the three of those nine that we don't test. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if we saw abnormalities in growth hormone. The problem is clinically, we just don't know what to do with that. And so that's why I don't particularly study it. And we don't have really great testing for growth hormone. Um, but I have seen growth um, delays, and I've seen them recover with proper therapy. As far as cognitive things, um, I had one patient. She was four years old. When Hurricane Sandy hit, her, the apartment her family was living in got water damage. And six months later, she was diagnosed with um, autism. Had been perfectly normal, maybe a mild speech delay before that, and now all of a sudden she's autistic. I found them, or the mom found me, we talked about it, we treated her in two months. She saw the neuropsychologist again and said, this isn't autism. I mean, it was completely reversed, what they had called autism. And now she goes to regular school and has no problems. So we clearly can see developmental delays, and we can see them reverse. I've been involved in several cases of children who had developmental delays after being exposed to um, water damaged buildings that had gone to uh, litigation. And we were able to show that you know, these kids had, had complete reversal with therapy. And when you look at the literature, you see that these kids are not alone. Right. Okay, yeah. great. And, um, okay, and so and the child was showing some other kind of developmental delay, not specifically cognitive, but maybe in some other areas, social or learning, uh, or sorry, learning is probably part of cognitive, but some other forms of developmental delay. Uh, is that something that you would still consider looking at SERS as a contributory factor? Absolutely. Okay, great. Okay, so it sounds like, uh, so I guess in summary, SERS is, in, from today, one of the big things I've got out of this, Dr. Milan, is it's such a huge problem in children, and it can cause such an array of, 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 of different issues. So I've certainly learned a lot, of, uh, a lot from this webinar, and I hope everyone listening has as well, and that's been very enriching, and it's given you some more confidence around knowing um, how you can get your children further assessed um, and or diagnosed for SIRS. And um, I'd like to give a big thank you to Dr. Scott McMahon for joining us today. It's been very, very informative and I'm really, really appreciative of, of you um, sparing your time for this call. And I also want to just acknowledge you for your, your contributions to this field of SIRS um, through these studies that you're publishing. And I think that's making a, a big difference to the advancement of this field. So thank you for all the, the late nights um, that you're putting in here to, to advancing this field. So thank you, and, and also yeah, and also I want to say thank you to Caleb Brud for uh, for the technical support and the content support. I mean, there's no way we would have been able to have done this without him. So um, have a great rest of your day, everyone, whether you're in the U.S. or Australia or elsewhere. And um, yeah, we hope that you have a, a healthy and um, happy rest of the year. So um, thank you, and bye for now. Thank you, Sandeep. Welcome.